Good morning again. Um, you know, sometimes when we're in worship and we're singing some of the songs, um, I don't know if, at least this happens to me, maybe it's just a preacher thing, but uh, I'm like, oh, I want to just stop and, and preach on that song right there. You know, we're singing these things, you know, and it's like, God, that's what I want. <laughs> That's what I want to experience. That's what I want to encounter. And it just, you know, but if I'm not careful, I'll chase after that and uh, we'll have a few sermonettes for the message. So I'm going to let them lay so that we can get into this this morning. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, let's pray. Let's begin with prayer. I'm going to give you a moment to pray yourself, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do, is ask God, whether you're watching online or you're in here, to ask God to quiet all the other thoughts that compete in your mind for God's word this morning, okay? And so would you do that? Take a, take a moment in your own heart to do that. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse sixteen. I'd love to to pull in the fuller context of what we're about to read. But I just want to read a phrase out of this that I want to bring to our attention this morning. But let's read just the verse. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. When you read those words, or when you listen to those words, what comes to mind? <laughs> well, okay. Wow. All right. The pandemic. Uh, fatigue. Pandemic fatigue. There's a phrase in here that says, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed. And so, just to set this up this morning, what I want you to think about is this, that we all have an outer man and an inner man. And I'm looking at you, and I can see your outer man or outer woman, okay? I can see your frame. I can see your bodies, okay, sitting here. And by looking, I can see there's a lot of decay. No, I'm teasing. But, no, we are, we are all from birth beginning to degenerate, are we not? Even though for a while it looks like we're, you know, we're springing forward and getting better and better and better, yet scientists and doctors will tell us that the body is degenerating. It's decaying. And some of us can can recognize that in our own life. Things that 
that don't work as well as they once worked. <laughs> okay? But sometimes, if we're not careful, we allow that inner man, that inner person, to follow in the footsteps of the outer man. As it's degenerating, as it's decaying, we just allow that inner man, what is that inner man? Whether, whether you call it the spirit or the soul, we'll call it the soul this morning. The soul is, is the real essence of who we are. And if we're not careful, we will allow the soul to follow, as I said a moment ago, what's happening with the outer man. But here, he fully expresses that though the outer man is decaying, the inner man is not supposed to decay. The inner man, it says, is being renewed. Renewal. When you think of renewing, what do you think of it? Well, there's something new, and it's made new again. It's made new even better, and new again and again and again. It's renewing and renewing and renewing. How frequently, how often? Well, according to what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says day by day. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That is not automatic. I'll tell you what is automatic, that our outer man is decaying day by day. It just one more day, it's just a little bit older, it's just a little bit more breaking down, just a little bit, bit more decay, okay? But the inner man is supposed to be going in the opposite direction, but it's not automatic. Even though the intent is that day by day, so... <laughs> If, if you, I don't, I don't, maybe this is the wrong way to look at it. The outer man, day by day, is decaying, going this way. And the inner man is supposed to be renewing day by day, going this way. So, how do we ensure that our inner man is renewing day by day? This will require attention of each one of us. We could call it, if you want to, we could call it soul care. Soul care. I have a question for you. I want you to think about this. How well do you tend to the care of your own soul. Nobody else can. We can do a little bit. We can come out and throw a little fertilizer on everybody, okay? We can do whatever, but, but mostly, soul care is something that you have to do. It's required of each one of us. That doesn't mean we don't care for one another, but... The question is, how well do you tend for the care of your own soul? About two years ago, it was up on YouTube or whatever else. I don't even remember where I saw it. Uh, how many of you know who Chris Pratt is? <laughs> okay, all right. Got famous through Guardians of the Galaxy and, and a few other uh, fun type movies. Okay, he is a outspoken believer, a Christian in Jesus Christ and is quite vocal about it and he walks in an interesting world to be able to do that. But he was, um, he was on a uh, MTV Awards, kind of one of the worst places you want to find yourself, I think. <laughs> I don't know anything redeeming about MTV today. But he was on the MTV Rewards rewards, awards, and he was um, uh, a, a speaker. He came up to give us a talk about something, and he, this was what it was. 
nine rules for life. This was his nine rules for life. Did anybody see that? A couple, maybe. Okay, nine rules for life. It was, some of it was humorous and funny. He's trying to speak to this generation of people that if you're too serious, they're not gonna take you seriously, right? So he throws a few funny things in there. But he had two or three things that were powerful. And I don't remember what number this was, but I just remember it stood out to me because I saw they kept playing it on different places. But he said this, like, Rule number six for life, you have a soul. Be careful what you do with it. I thought, man, that is profound, especially speaking to a a world that doesn't take too many things very seriously, probably, you know. But you have a soul, Take care of it. And, and there was a, some of the re- reaction and response in the crowd was, was kind of amazing too, just, just to see it. If you don't take care of your soul, it will atrophy. It will decay. And it will morph into some kind of a deformed soul. So I asked y'all two weeks ago, the message, what form does your soul take? If you were able to just reach inside, pull out your soul, and set it right there before you, what would it look like? Is it a happy soul? Is it a bitter soul? What is the shape and form of that soul? Is it all flabby and floppy and, you know, is it dark? Is it bright? As you think about this, about your own soul, I'm just going to run through a few things and ask, do any of these uh, relate to anything that, for you personally, how would you answer these questions? Is your soul weak or is it strong? Is your soul lazy or is it responsible? Is your soul beautiful Or is it ugly? Is your soul happy or sad? Sinful or godly? Is your soul misshapen in some way or is it true to form? The way God intended. Is it bitter or sweet? Your soul. Is your soul... God-filled or God-empty? Is it proud or humble? Here's one. Is your soul restful or weary? Peaceful or anxious? We all have a soul. Be careful what you do with it. We can ruin our soul. That's the thing. Through unforgiveness, our soul can warp and deform into something quite ugly. Through lustful desires, it can become quite self-absorbed and empty and void, thinking it's filling itself up and it's just emptying out. 
all kinds of things that we can do to ruin our soul. Here's the thing, guys. Enough on that. Your soul, my soul, our soul was made for God. It was made by God. It was made in his image, and we were given this soul, put into a body that is degenerating, that is decaying, but the soul is supposed to be being renewed day by day. And so God has given us a soul, but that soul was made for him, and it functions only, I don't, I don't want to say best, it only functions when God is the center of its existence. When he's left out of it, that soul goes amok. It goes, it deforms, it, it uh, becomes something ugly, becomes something other than what God intended. Our soul needs to be near to Jesus. That's the point. If our soul was made for God, and it's going to be renewed day by day, it's going to have to be near to Jesus. As Christians, as Christians, our soul needs to be two things. One is it needs intimacy with Jesus. Whether, whether you're talking about abiding with him or his spirit dwelling within you, each one of us as Christians, we need intimacy with Jesus. But secondly, we need more of Jesus to change us, to form us, to shape us into his likeness. Those are the two things, as Christians, we're supposed to be pursuing to, to form and shape our soul, okay? That's the first thing. But we have what I call the big three, okay? The big three that I hear so much from people, both sometimes in here, sometimes out there, in the world, this is what I call the big three. And, it, and it's, it's heartbreaking. It's, a, it, it's something that, that I really wrestle over as a shepherd of souls. That's what I'm supposed to be. <laughs> I'm not the only one. We're all supposed to be doing this. But, but as a pastor, pastor means shepherd. A shepherd is somebody, I'm not so much shepherding your bodies as I'm trying to shepherd souls. And so when I look at these big three, it burdens me. I wrestle with it. I pray over it. I'm like, God, help us with this. Here's the big three. This is what so many of us as Christians, not just, it's, it's totally true of non-Christians, okay? But it appears to be true of too many Christians as well. Let's just skip this and go on to something else. <laughs> what? You want it? Really? Okay. Here's what I call the big three. Three things that we all feel constantly like we need. And don't get me wrong, we do need these. But why do we need them so much? All the time. The first one, uh, I need rest. I'm tired. I'm weary. I don't have enough time. Always chasing, running. I <laughs> just, man, how's it going? Oh, man, what a week I've had. You said that last week. And then I remember two weeks ago I asked you how it was going, and you said the same thing. You're tired. You're weary. Not just your physical body, but your soul, that inner part of you is just wore out. And yes, indeed, we each need rest. Our inner man needs rest. But if all the time, if every week upon week, day upon day, 
<laughs> we need rest again, and that, that's always our, our thing. Something's wrong. That's not supposed to be the norm for Christians. Would you agree with me? How do we change that? Man, I want to see it changed. That's the first one. We're talking about the big three. The second one, peace. I just want peace. My, I, there's so much turbulence, you know, disturbance, conflict in my life, in my inner soul. I'm just, you know, just all of this stuff going on, and we just, we crave peace. And here Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. Why, God, can you just give me some of that? I just want some of that peace to sustain me. And it's, it's always like, there's not enough. I need more. I'll squeeze a little bit more out of you, Jesus. I need it. Why? Why, why are we seemingly deprived of rest and peace? The third one, happiness. I, now, I used to go, I, I used to preach that joy is a biblical principle, happiness is a selfish principle. We just need joy, but not happiness. You know, happiness is too close to, I don't know, something else. No, I really believe that God intended for us to be happy too. Joy and happiness are not exactly the same, but we were created to be happy. You know, the fullest happiness is in his presence and joy. But so many are discouraged, disappointed, anxious, and depressed in their lives. And you say, in, just in their life or their spiritual life? If it's in your life, it's both. You can't just say, in my spiritual life, I'm super really happy and joyful and everything else, but in my normal life, I'm depressed and anxious. No, no, no. You can't make that dichotomy. Those are, those are flags. If I'm always at, at a state of unrest, if I'm always in a place of no peace, if I'm always in a place of being unhappy with my life, those are flags to say, hey, something's awry. There's something wrong with your soul. You're not tending to the care of your own soul. Sometimes, and, and so what that leads us to is this whole, this whole question of, as Christians, we need, we need to be in Jesus' presence. We need deeper intimacy with him. We need his life-transforming work in our lives. But sometimes that goal and these other big three seem to be at cross purposes with one another. Because as much as I need Jesus changing my life, when I start talking about seeking him, you know what it sounds like? Work. <laughs> Something hard. It, it, it starts going, oh, no. Oh, it got, uh, it's hard to pick this thing up and turn the pages. Oh, it's hard to read. You know, and we just, we turn it into something heavy, a weight. And yet, it's what we need. Somehow, we let this, this view or picture of, of needing him, and we really, really do, but it's just going to be so hard to get there, we just go, oh. I'm burdened by this. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just like, I, I've lost ways to tell people how to seek God because they've tried some of the things and it just, nothing happened, they gave up, it, was, it wore them out, it just, what, you know, and, and then I start saying, well, if you would pray more, and I just know what that sounds like. <sighs> if you're already exhausted, if you're already 
not at peace. You don't have that motivation to want to do what, what you need to do in your life, to tend to the care of your own soul. And so I'm like, God, surely there's another way. There's another way to show. I mean, I mean, I sometimes think we walk around like this. Well, God, God is God, and I'm just a man. God knows where, where I'm at. He can, he can call my name out anytime he wants to. If he wants to be near me, you know, it's like, come on. Come on, God. I mean, look, I got a cell phone. God can call me. You know, why do I have to work at this? Let him do it. You know, and it's like, he can text me. Hey, can I let you in on a little secret? He has texted you. <laughs> he is speaking. So, all right. Would y'all like to look at a verse of scripture? Let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, <laughs> verse 2. How many of you have New American Standard? <laughs> For you. <laughs> um, no, there some of the other versions uh, give nuanced meanings, not meanings, but help, helps you see it a little bit better. But here it is. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. So, here's what I want you to see. He says, do not be conformed to this world. Can y'all read that? Ah. Okay, you can see it up there <laughs> on the big screen. Okay, this says, do not be conformed. Now, again, two weeks ago, I pulled out a word out of conformed. What was the word? Form. So when he's talking about something forming or conforming, he's talking about our soul. Don't let your soul that you and I are supposed to take care of, right? Don't let it be conformed to this world. To this world. Oh, there's no lid on that one. I don't want to use pink. That's not cool. All right. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. There's our word again, form. But be transformed. Now look what it says. Be transformed by the renewing. There's our word again. Of your mind. Now I gave it a space there because something's missing. He says, do not be conformed to. That's a what question. What, what are we not supposed to be conformed to? To the world. The way, the form that the world has. Some of your versions say the pattern of this world. That's a pattern. That's a mo I love this version. There's a version, um, the Phillips translation says this. Do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. A mold is a form, is a pattern, is a shape. 
Our soul has a pattern to it, has a, has a mold, has a shape, a form, right? So he says, do not be conformed to this world, but he says, be transformed, and I'm asking the question, to what? He doesn't tell us there. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed, okay. He answers, he, he answers the how, and we'll get to that in a moment, but he doesn't answer the what here. What's up with that? What? What are we supposed to be transformed to? Well, if we know our Bibles, and we're somewhat familiar with the book of Romans, the letter of Romans, we might know the answer to that. Does anybody know? 829. Okay. So, Romans 829 says that we are predestined to, there it is, and I'm just going to put this in in a different color so that we know it's actually not there, but it's certainly, he knows that his readers already know this, predestined to be conformed, there's the word again, be conformed to the image of of his son, we'll just say of Jesus, the image of Christ. He's already laid that out four chapters earlier. That that is the big goal, that you and I, our soul should take form or shape to the image of Christ. His character, his heartbeat, his mindset, his values, his purposes, all of those things to know him and to be like him. That's our journey. That's our goal. That's what he's trying to do with us. And he says, hey, there, there's an alternative path that I don't want for you. And that is to be conformed to this world. I want you to be transformed, meaning transformed to the image of Christ. Now, we've answered the what question. Now, he gives us the answer to the how. And this is a key thing. By renewing, by the renewing of your mind. Okay? Now, we read this passage, and a lot of people talk about that, and we can turn that into philosophy. We can turn that into theology. I'm renewing my mind. You know, this is not a cognitive behavioral thing. You know what I'm saying? He's not saying, hey, let's just fill our mind with good substantive knowledge and it will transform us. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not against theology or even philosophy or any other discipline, okay? But what he has in mind here for us in renewing our mind is something that's way more deeply spiritual, way more deeply um, uh, intimate. It is the knowing of Christ, and in that in and, and 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 that continuation of that. If we go back to Second Corinthians chapter four, <clears throat> we're supposed to be our inner man is supposed to being renewed. What day by day? That requires a a rhythm, doesn't it? What if I skip a day? What if I skip three days? What happens to my soul if I skip a week or two? It just starts to <laughs> wilt and atrophy. It's not as strong in the next moment of spiritual challenge in my life. You know, if I just let my soul get all wimpy, you know, and then I get this really strong spiritual challenge or temptation in my life, get back, devil, you know. No, there's, there's no, it's like, boom, I'm gonna be plowed over. If I don't, if I don't day by day build up the form, 
I'm being transformed into this image of Christ. If I don't have, if my inner man is not full of Christ, if it's not gaining the strength of Christ, if I'm not thinking the way Jesus would think, if my values are really quick, this alternative starts, starts to come in and change my thinking, change my perspective. I, I, hear, I hear this all the time. In a moment when you're doing a teaching, people all agree with the truth. But then uh, uh, three days later, when the real challenge comes up, well, this person just really hurt me. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind, and I'm gonna, they're, they're not going to get free. What is that? Have you ever seen that? From Christians. We say things like that. What, what are we doing? We're, we're thinking like that. Instead of back over here, renewing my mind, the mind of Christ. The Bible talks about that multiple times about renewing our mind. I could go from scripture to scripture to scripture. And I, and I, well, I like to do that, actually. You don't like me to do that because it makes long sermons. <laughs> Just show you the same thing over and over and over in another place. I love that because the redundancy of it shows that it's really, really a truth that we need to grasp onto. So why are we on this right now? Because I'm burdened that next week or sometime this next week, you or I are going to be in a place where we're just going, God, I'm so not at peace in my soul. How long have you been in that place? You're a Christian? When was the last time you had a day and day, day after day, renewing process in your life? And you're not just, you're not just waiting for, for God to, to initiate it. Scripture says, draw near to me and I will draw near, God will draw near to us. Amen. He already did the first drawing near. He initiated the process of you coming to a saving knowledge of him. Now, he expects us to walk in it to initiate those times each day. Am I going to sleep in? No, I'm going to get up. Am I going to race off to work or am I going to take time? Not because God demands it, not because, not because it's a duty to do, but because I need it. I was made for God. My soul was made for that. And if I don't submit my soul to a place where he can pour back into me, I do not have that strength in that moment of that day or that week or the things that come. I'm not expecting it. If I knew the, the battles I was going to fight in the next month, then I would prepare for those particular battles. But I don't know which one they're going to come. So what I need is just Jesus' time. Jesus in my life so that he knows what I'm going to need in that given moment. So the key to our transformation is this right here. Renewing. Renewing. Man, I want to go deeper in more verses, but I'm not. Because you got enough of this idea. Or we have, excuse me. You can look at, ah, no, we're going to look at one more. We got time, really quick. All right. Ephesians, chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 20 through 24, says this. You did not learn Christ in this way. How did you learn Christ? That's the question I'd be asking. You did not learn Christ in this way. So he's talking about something previous. He's talking about the way the unbelievers used to think and behave and act and all those things. He said, you didn't learn Jesus this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, the old form the old shape, the way your life used to be. 
You lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So, what is he saying here? He's saying the same thing, but he's using a different kind of metaphor to make his point. But here it is. We got the old self, and the old self is, is the old it's the old form of the soul. And that, that's everything about the inner man. It's your thought life. It's your way you make your choices. It's your conscience. It's your emotions. It's all that internal part, okay? And so here's the old self. And he says the old self, oh yeah, we'll do it like this. The old self is being corrupted. What does corrupt mean? Huh? What? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's degenerating. It's, you know, and a moral corruption is, is even worse, not even physical corruption. But he says, here's the new self, um, which is your new form. Your, your soul being shaped by Jesus Christ, becoming more like Jesus. And in this one, he says, he uses a different word. Not corrupted, but what? Find the word. Look at your, look at your verses really quick. I'll give you 15 seconds to find the word that's opposite of corrupted. Righteousness is a good word. Holiness, that's a good word too. Likeness, those are good words. <laughs> They're there. All those words are there. Renew, all these are good. These are good. These are good. Come on, somebody's going to find it. Created. There it is. So, the old self, it, we're not created into the old self. We're fallen. We're corrupted, okay? But just as you were created with the first form, now he's recreating you and I. And that's the work that happens in this renewing process is when we, when we submit ourselves to God, when we take time to pursue these other practices that bring us into close proximity to him, then he is able to work at recreating and renewing us, okay? And that's what we want. That's the motivation you and I have to see the motivation for this or we'll never do it. I will not read my Bible if it's just a duty. I will not read my Bible if I don't have something that comes from it that renews my mind. I won't read my Bible if, if somehow it's not transforming my life. I won't pray. I won't serve. I won't give. I won't do these things. I, I won't deal with the, the temptations and struggles of life, I'll just. But if I'm coming into close proximity with him, if I'm in some sense coming into his presence, and that's what I look for when I have daily quiet time or whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm not just looking to understand a new thing. Oh, there's a new truth. Wow, great, cool. Stick it in this place in my lobe somewhere. I can teach it to somebody else someday. No, that truth is for, is for me to chew on and then becomes a part of my life, becomes something I live out and walk in. Makes me more like this, what I'm being transformed into. Look at Colossians 3, 9, and 10 on your own. I'd love to just get into that, but we don't have time. <clears throat> now, where does this go for us? My burden, 
that I feel as a shepherd is that I want to see God's people vibrant, alive. I want to see them not worn out, exhausted. I want to see them maintaining a state of restfulness in Christ. I don't want to see people anxious and, and, you know, turbulent always in their life. I want to see a peacefulness and a happiness. But these are things that come from the hand of God when we spend time in his presence, when we seek him. And it's his joy to give us those things. I understand the spiritual battle. I understand that there's a struggle. But which is, which is easier and harder? Just to, just to let what it feels like it's going to be hard to, to go spend this time with God or to seek him and then live with the constant depression of it because I don't have his strength? Or is it better to wade through that and come to that place where he just fills my soul? I know we know the answer to that. Here's what we're doing on Wednesday night. On Wednesday nights, we're coming up here and we're, pra- we're putting into practice some new ways of seeking God. Right now, we're starting with just the word. So the last couple of weeks, we've just been coming in and we get the men with the men and the women with the women. And, and it, it's, an, it's maybe a very different approach than you've had before. Because sometimes we take, we take scripture and we read it like it's just a book. And all I'm really trying to do is intellectually understand it. And then we take that information and we put it wherever. Versus, I want to read this in such a way that I have a listening heart. Because I think God wants to say something to me. I think he wants to renew my mind. I think he wants to create in me the new self. I think he wants to transform me into something like himself. And I don't think I can do that through just an intellectual study. And I'm all for that. Don't get me wrong. I like to have my theological I's dotted and T's crossed. And there's a place for that. But I'm telling you, if that's all we do, um, it's no wonder that we fall short. It's no wonder that our soul feels empty. Or can be. So we're trying to do some of these things on Wednesday night because you can't do them on Sunday. But it's all about trying to do this right here. Not allow. We do these other practices or we don't do any at all and we're just subject to the way the world wants to squeeze us into its mold versus I want him to reshape, reform my soul to look more like Jesus, to have the strength that he would have, to have the joy that he would have. And then God can do incredible things with us. So, I want to leave you with this, something practical. (laughs) Maybe you don't feel like there's anything practical in this right now. That's what we're doing on Wednesday nights. But let me, let me tell you one of the things I'm just trying to do. And Jeremiah, you can come on up to do announcements if we've got any. <clears throat> Biggest announcement is come Wednesday nights from 6 to 7.30. It will be worth your time. But don't judge it on one experience. You gotta, we, gotta, we have to under, value what rhythms do for our life. Day to day. Week to week. Those kind of things, okay? Um, <clears throat> I'll just keep this real simple. Whether you're going to go to have a time of prayer with God 
or whether you're going to read your Bible, can I ask you to start doing one practice before you do either one of those? Would you take four or five minutes to always, before you race in to do any of those things, would you just learn how to quiet your mind and still, still your soul? Before you even start, just take time to do that. Because if we don't do that, if, I, if I've got three things coursing through my mind, and I'm trying to read this too, my mind's going back and forth, back and forth, flipping back and forth. There's competition for my thoughts, my mind. There's competition. I want to silence those things before I start reading this. Plus, what I'm doing is I'm saying, God, I just want to hear one voice. I don't want to hear two. I don't want to hear three. I don't want to hear my voice and your voice. I don't want to hear my voice, voices from the world, from the workplace, from home. I just, I want to quiet my soul, my mind, and get myself in a, a place where I can listen. And the same with prayer. Don't race into prayer. Start by quieting. Your, yeah, and, and then you can be very clear and simple in what you're praying for. Or taking time to listen. Because God will show you sometimes what you need to be praying for. And sometimes it's not praying for things to get done. Sometimes it's a, it can be somewhat of a, a dialogue. God wants to speak. and can, can there ever be prayer that's not about getting something done? It's just about intimacy with him. God says, I love you, Bo. Do you, do you really love me, Lord? How? What, how could you love me? You know, and then he says something else. I loved it when you did the, oh, I didn't even think about it. You know, maybe there's correspondence that way. So, because what you're looking for is intimacy with him and then transformation. 